right. Welcome, everybody. I am Todd Wyant. Welcome to the Bridging the Gap podcast. You're invited to join my mission to embrace and share the innovations transforming the AEC, MEP, and the manufacturing industries. My guest today is a trained civil engineer who felt the tempting call of the field. He has designed and managed many projects, was an agent to the owners, and has been an early adopter of technology. Jason Barber is the Vice President of Industry Solutions and Strategy at Manufacton. Welcome to the show, Jason. Thanks, Todd. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So how does a civil engineer become a construction innovation technologist? <laughs> um, thanks for asking. That's a, you know, an interesting journey and one that um, if you'd asked me when I was first a civil engineer that that was going to happen, I'd say there's no way that <laughs> you're crazy. Like, why would I do that? Um, you know, for me, I realizing now I was always a, a technology nerd, you know, self-admittedly, there's a lot of other construction dorks out there. And, uh, you know, I started out as a civil engineer, started, you know, surveying, designing and managing my own construction projects. I was one of the, the weird ones that said, hey, I don't want to be stuck in an office. I want to get out in the field and, you know, worked a lot on airport projects, highways, different infrastructure, industrial jobs. And, you know, did that for about 15 plus years in different, you know, different careers and different uh, positions, but got to the point where I was like, you know what, I keep trying to do innovation from inside of a company and, you know, adopting certain things. And it just got to the point where I was like, you know what, I care a ton about this industry and I really want to help you an agent a change of it. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's it's frustrating from the inside to see how hard people work and how many hours they put in to build these amazing projects that really help people's lives. But then they're doing it with technology and things that are, you know, old, outdated, inefficient, like they're just working so hard in some ways where they don't have to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can see that in other industries and ours, you know, it's not that we haven't innovated in construction. We absolutely have, um, but just not to the level that we could or we should. You know, mm -hmm. that's part of my perspective of it. Yeah. I'm interested. You said the um, mindset of an agent of change. What, what do you think that mindset is of the agent of change and then the kind of pairing it with the early adopter of technology? I think, you know, from my perspective, there's a, a balance that you've got to have, you know, you've got to really take that sort of pleased but not satisfied attitude. Like, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, uh, we built this project successfully or, you know, we got it under, under budget, but, you know, could we have done better? Could we not have had to do shutdowns and work straight for four weeks type of a thing and make people not go home to their families and, you know, some of those kinds of things. And mm -hmm. also, but having the same uh, balance of pragmatism, you know, really saying, okay, there's reasons that that happens. It's not that technology is the savior of all or that, you know, some new method can be the silver bullet to solve those problems. It's more, okay, here's what the real situation is. We've got, you know, complex tasks. We've got lots of different stakeholders. They can't make up their minds or they're, you know, changing things all the time. Well, how can we work to, you know, adapt to those situations, recognize them, and then again, take that sort of please but not satisfied attitude. How do we not be satisfied with that answer? How do you say, well, I want to do it better. I want to do it differently. I want to, you know, look at outside the box. Can we think of a new way of using technology, whether that's hardware or software or processes or means and methods, or maybe we just need to bring somebody new in who has a different perspective. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's what, you know, being that agent of change really means is, is again, just taking that attitude of, yeah, okay, we did pretty good or we didn't do so good, but you know, what can we do differently in the future? Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so what's your favorite part of testing out new technology? My favorite part is when, you know, we've been designing things or, you know, I've been working with development teams and then you get it far enough along, like where you kind of had this idea or this vision and you get it far enough along where it really starts to be usable and you see like how it can really affect the industry and that part you're just like oh my god you know people don't even the developers or design teams they're they don't quite get it and you're like this little thing is going to have such a huge impact like it's going to make it so everybody knows what material is going to show up or that mm -hmm. everybody 
you know, you've got this visibility to certain things that you just was not possible before. And that's, that's what excites me. It's like, I'm going to save people real time and I'm going to have where I'm helping them make their jobs. Not so difficult. That that's the part I love about it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I see that. It, I imagine too, the, on the flip side though, it, it could get kind of frustrating that here you're seeing all this value and you're banging your head against the wall. Like, why don't you see this? Come on. It's, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Laughing because it's better than crying. <laughs> how, do you, how do you deal with that frustration and, and try to kind of cut through that and, and get people to, to see the vision? Um, I don't know that I have the, the perfect answer for that, but because um, I think I'm still working through that the some people you know um maybe it's a little bit uh cutthroat or maybe it's a little bit disheartening uh, some people just aren't ready um and it's almost just as important to recognize the folks that aren't ready for that mm -hmm. change as the ones that you know there's almost like that whole stage of change you know from a change management perspective there's people who are just on the forefront and they're like yes i i love it i'm willing to try stuff i don't you know, if it fails, that's great, actually, because I'm gonna learn something from it. That's, you know, one portion of people out there. And then there's another portion that's like, well, I kind of want to change, but I'm not really sure I kind of need some convincing, mm -hmm. you know, how help me understand it. And then once you help them understand it, they, they just, they're in, you know, and they're the ones that are just going to be locked in for, you know, to that idea of change for a long time. And then there's others that they're just, you know, people are afraid of change and some of them, they're like, Hey, this is my routine. This is what I'm comfortable with. This is the way I've been doing it for a really long time. And sometimes you just have to pick where you put your energy and, you know, can't, can't change everybody. Right. Yeah. So the importance of knowing where somebody is in the process of change. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, what's their, what's their appetite for change too? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, uh -huh. I think that's good uh, of knowing where they are in the process. And then you're just trying to get them to the next step, not all the way to the finish line every single time. Right. Yeah. I, some people you can get them there and some people you, you can't. And, you know, I would love to get all of them there at some point, but you know, can't boil the ocean either. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, what do you think is the most kind of exciting technology to come out in the last five years? There's, um, come out or be adopted. You know, there's a lot of technology that's been around for a long time, but it just hasn't been really that adopted. Um, the one that I think a lot of people don't really think about as much, or they almost take for granted is, is mobile. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, a mobile phone, the way we use it now, you know, tablets and cell phones, you know, the iPhone's what, 11 years old now, 12 years old now. Yeah. And it's still not fully adopted, you know, by the, the construction industry, that one to me is, you know, we've got really cool apps and there's more and more of them, you know, monthly, it seems like for the construction industry. But most of those, those applications are maybe two to five years old max. Um, you know, if we had an Uber of construction or, you know, I mean, one of mine that uh, I keep, you know, joking with my wife is Home Depot needs to be Amazon Prime. Yeah. Like, That'd be amazing. Wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> like, and that's, you know, that's residential construction and, you know, smaller type projects. But if you had that kind of a service for, you know, larger construction projects, how phenomenal would that be? So mobile to me has been, um, from a hardware standpoint, one of the agents of change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, I think that's interesting because it, I think it's so easy to take mobile for granted. Because in our personal lives, it's, it's everywhere. You use it all the time. You don't right. even think that it's been around that recent, you know, or that it hasn't been around for forever because it, it's so integrated in our lives. Uh, so how do we bring that into the, the construction industry is an interesting yeah. take there. The other one that um, I'm really excited about what's going to happen with it, um, I think we're still pretty early stages is, you know, taking laser scanning, combining with, you know, point cloud imagery, you know, we, again, I look at a, a phone as not just a phone, it's a sensor. We've got this really powerful sensor with GPS information and a camera and that camera can take such high quality images that that becomes a point cloud. So, you know, it's basically low fidelity laser scanning of 
a site or of a cord and shell building or, you know, Hey, I'm <clears throat> in the process of doing a tenant improvement that <clears throat> that can feed into, you know, BIM models and you don't have to always, you know, get a really expensive pieces of equipment to go get a high detailed laser scan of a building. You know, that's stuff where that level of detail and laser scanning has been around for, you know, army Corps of engineers started developing it or army research labs like 35 years ago, 40 years ago, but it's, even in the last three years, it's had a big, you know, adoption trend just to make models mm -hmm. to then go build off of design off of. Um, so, you know, your real conditions, you know, what are you, what are you dealing with? Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, so safety is a, a big uh, buzzword and, and initiative in the industry right now, but how do we push it to the next level? Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm a, I'm a firm believer that safety is one of those things where we've, we've pushed the industry and we've pushed our, ourselves to really make it a priority. And there's certain companies that have been front runners of that for a long time. Um, generally workers in the field, <clears throat> they're not intentionally making decisions that put themselves at risk or put their coworkers at risk. I, I definitely believe that mm. um, it's usually a lack of knowledge or a lack of, autonomy. And I, I see it as, you know, there's lots of rules and best practices and all kinds of stuff, but you know, the human brain can only process so much information at a time. How do we make it so that, you know, they know the right information at that moment from a safety perspective. So like if I'm working on a scaffolding, well, um, if I knew exactly what's the right way to, you know, What's the right kind of harness? Do I need a retractable? Do I lead, need a lanyard? Are we using, you know, passive fall protection? Do I need a tow board? What's the weight of the dead man that I need for my rigging? Like all those things, like those are pretty complicated things and safety professionals can spend their entire careers knowing and learning all those aspects of it. Mm -hmm. To expect a construction worker <clears throat> whose normal job is framing or doing the waterproofing on that roof how can we reasonably expect them to have all that knowledge? So it's making that knowledge at the forefront, really easily consumable, and then helping them, you know, validate and, and discern that information. Mm -hmm. To me, I think that's kind of the, the next step. And it's, it's that training, that's that knowledge. So, you know, Hey, maybe there's a time in the future where guy's got a hard hat. He's got his augmented reality glasses on there. And it's showing him, hey, all right, now that you're climbing up on this scaffolding reminder, you need to move your, you know, hook from here to here on your harness. Like, yeah, that kind of stuff would just be phenomenal. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. It, it doesn't seem like the technology is that far away from getting there either. No, whether the adoption, that's a different question, but the, <laughs> right. the technology seems to be pretty close. <laughs> yeah. The technology seems pretty close. You know, I think, um, but that's one where we'll just have to be again, pragmatic about it. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's awesome. And technology can be a great way to solve that, but you know, it also, we don't want that augmented reality to be a distraction from people recognizing their own environments. You know? Right. Yeah, sure. My, one of my mantras, especially as I was, you know, running operations is look, I can, I can give every, anybody all the different safety requirements and best practices, but ultimately the only person who can keep from getting hurt is yourself. And then maybe the guy next to you or gal next to you, like you got to look out for yourself and look out for the person next to you because that I, I can't control that. Nobody else can control that. Like OSHA is not going to control that. Mm -hmm. It's about taking care of yourself and knowing that you have the autonomy to do something about it. And then also looking out for the person next to you. And mm -hmm. that's ultimately what it comes down to. And plus the knowledge and the training and all those. Sure. Well, let's get into some prefab. Uh, what do you see as kind of some of the, the main reasons somebody would use BIM for prefab? BIM for prefab, you know, to me, that's almost a, a no brainer. BIM is the easiest way to create a visualization and really get your head around uh, literally and figuratively <laughs> what you're building, you know, mm -hmm. and there's, 
you know, people who are trained professionals and been in the industry for a long time can look at a, a drawing, a 2D drawing, and really understand it pretty quickly. And they can almost visualize it. They're 3D visualizing it in their heads to then say like, all right, this is how we're going to build it. And I know what the dimensions need to be and I can do the layout. That's not always easy for other folks. So BIM is a great way to first work out all the details. Hence why it's called detailing. But work it out so that you know all those parts and pieces and you know how it's going to fit into the the broader building or structure or whatever it is um, gives you that real um, volumetric dimensionally accurate piece or pieces of pieces mm -hmm. to then say okay now we're going to go build it and we're going to build it in the shop because you know one of the challenges if you didn't have BIM and you're trying to do a bunch of prefab or offsite work. Now, you know, you wouldn't have the ability to work through those details within the construct of what you're going to put it into in the future. You don't, you know, traditional stick built things, you can go field measure all you want. Like what's the difference between this column line? Well, okay, I can go measure that and I can go cut the piece and make sure it fits. Mm -hmm. Well, if I'm trying to prefab it, I need to still cut it to that same accuracy but it's much more difficult for me to go field measure it, you know, with a tape measure or a laser or whatever. Right. I can measure it in BIM and BIM will give me the exact number, especially if my BIM model is dimensionally accurate, which they are now. I can fabricate it and have that real confidence that it's going to fit when I truck it two states over and go install it. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so as we're recording this, we're, we're all in the, the midst of social distancing and <laughs> all these new phrases that we <laughs> are, are learning about with COVID-19. Uh, do you think that this could potentially serve as a catalyst, though, and make prefab more common when we come out of this? I think it could. Uh, you know, we, we're all still figuring it out, obviously, Yeah, <laughs> what it means and, um, you know, what work from home or stay at home orders or shelter in place orders um, all those phrases. really mean all those new phrases we're we're learning and trying to figure out what they mean uh, I think you know i'm I'm hopeful that it will help us be that catalyst to say, okay, wait a minute, we're now having to think about new and different ways of working. We've been kind of dipping our toes in prefab as an industry. Why would we not you know take this opportunity to just go full blown into it. Mm -hmm. We're going to see a lot of the benefits that we've all been talking about it as an industry. And, um, you know, the, the tough part is now we're seeing another transition in the workforce You know, we, we're going to see people lose their jobs in the construction industry and we're going to have to attract them back, you know, much mm -hmm. like we did after 08, 09. And we, we as an industry didn't do a great job, uh, honestly, of attracting people back. Like we've got, even before the whole COVID situation, we had less workers in construction in, in North America than we did pre-2008. Mm -hmm. um, now it could be, well, you know, why we want these controlled environments. We want to create, you know, good workforces and good workplaces. Um, so who wouldn't want to work in a factory as opposed to out on a job site that could be 120 degrees or it could be, you know, minus 10 degrees, depending on where you're at in the country and what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think when you, when you get into some of the, the issues of, of attracting people in the industry, I, you know, I come at it through a, a marketing lens, but it, it seems like there is a marketing issue going on that the, for whatever reason, the industry just isn't great at uh, marketing themselves to potential employees of the, all the cool stuff that they're doing and the, the safety, there's such this uh, misperception about what it means to actually be in the field, in the construction industry. And, and what do you do all day long? Um, that, that I think if the industry could kind of wrap its mind around how do we market it better, then that would solve some of the issue. Not, not it wouldn't get you all the way there, but it, it, you would start to see some more attraction to the construction industry because it's a cool industry. I, has you awesome are, technology, really cool stuff that's going on. Yeah. <laughs> just gotta tell those stories. Like pride of ownership, pride of workmanship, like, you know, and the the people in the industry are are awesome. 
-hmm. they're some of the most genuine people across the board. They, you know, kind of by nature, kind of by the situations you're in, like you have this shared common goal and that could be as simple as like, all right, we're going to go get this, you know, apartment building built. Well, if you took the moment to step back, like, Hey, I'm building housing for people. That That's pretty cool. And that's a pretty simple project, but other ones like, all right, maybe I'm building a wastewater treatment plant. That doesn't sound that flashy or that exciting, but guess what? We all got to flush our toilets in that, you know, we as an industry are addressing the needs of people like in our modern society. And I think we forget that we don't market it very well. We do a terrible job of marketing it. So we just, you know, the opportunities in the construction industry for anybody and everybody, you know, to talk about an industry where you can start from the very beginning and work your way up into some, you know, senior positions and have as many opportunities as you want and really be proud of what you've done. There's not as many, not too many industries that, that have that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So if, if you're building offsite, how do you know if you're on the, the right track or the wrong track going forward? Um, I think the right or the wrong track, I don't know that there's a definitive right or wrong track. Um, I think the wrong track is if you, if you come at prefab and saying like, okay, this is going to solve all my problems. Um, that's not realistic. Mm -hmm. I think it's to get on the right track. You've got to say, well, what are, what are the goals I'm trying to accomplish with prefab? Am I, you know, trying to get my labor rates down, you know, because of, or am I trying, is my core goal to attract a different workforce or is my core goal to address some really complex scheduling things? You know, so we've got a, I'll just comes to mind. I've got a customer who they're prefabbing a bunch of wall panels um, for a hospital that's in Newfoundland. Well, Newfoundland's construction season is about as short as it gets, um, except for maybe like far, you know, Fairbanks or something like that. Yeah. And it's a pretty big hospital and their, their whole thing was like, we probably won't save any money. Maybe we will. Um, but we don't know how we would execute on this job without prefabbing all the exterior wall panels inside of a factory, shipping them all there, being able to set them super quickly and get the wall, the whole building closed in so that we can work through the winter. And otherwise you wouldn't be able to do that job. Um, it would be really, really difficult or it would take so much longer because you've got six weeks to two months of a construction season to mm. get that thing closed in. So I think that, you know, right or wrong track of prefab, you got to really think about what are your goals and, don't try to make a whole bunch of goals, pick two to three and really decide, all right, you know, here's what we're going to tackle. Here's what our you know, focus areas are going to be schedule improvements or workforce or, you know, costs or even maybe quality, quality and safety can be ones in and of themselves, you know, which also tie to some of those financial gains, mm -hmm. but Hey, are we having problems where we're doing a lot of rework or, one of the ugliest terms is refab. So you can do prefab, but are you having to do refab because you prefabbed <laughs> it wrong? Uh, well, that's, that's not helpful. <laughs> so just taking those focused areas and uh, really just tackling them and putting those processes and having the, the discipline, that's, that's how you know you're on the right track. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so are there any kind of routines for success that people can incorporate when they're, they're thinking through it and trying to do offsite and prefab? Yeah, I think the routine is um, almost in parallel to kind of picking what the core challenges you want to tackle is picking what pieces, um, you know, so don't, don't look at your whole job if you're an electrician or a mechanical contractor and say, well, we're going to prefab everything. Well, mm. that's again, that's not realistic to say, well, all right, maybe we're gonna just prefab all of the receptacles and the whips. Let's just do that on this first job and let's get really good at that and figure out how we can standardize, you know, the parts and pieces as much as possible with that. Or, you know, maybe I'm just gonna standardize what kind of Unistrut we use. You know, simple things like that where maybe it's the hangers and we, if you looked at all your projects, you've got 15 different types of Unistrut that all accomplish the same thing. Like, mm -hmm let's just pick 
maybe three or four that we can still use for different weights and different anchorages and that kind of stuff. But instead of trying to have people who know how to build and assemble those 50 different kinds of Unistrut, they get really, really good at three to four kinds of Unistrut. So I think that's when you're starting in that prefab journey, that's probably the best place to start is, okay, let's pick three to five things that we're just going to focus on and get, get really good and do that whole kind of lean methodology of continuous improvement, like mm -hmm. do measure, check, change, improve, like, and just keep, keep going through it uh, to really see and, and realize those gains that you can get. Yeah. The, the whole practice makes perfect mentality there. Yep. Nice. Well, how can you practice something if you're doing it differently all the time? Good point. <laughs> you can't, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not at least if you want to get good at it. <laughs> right. It makes it really hard. Uh, so uh, on that vein in with prefab, what does productivity mean to you? Productivity is a really interesting one, you know, productivity, um, with prefab and you see this as people going to go through the maturity curve of prefab. Um, you know, most, most people in the construction industry look at productivity is how many labor hours, direct labor hours did it take for me to do this? And that's super important. That's a big driver in your business. That's probably one of the biggest variables um, in your business that determines, you know, profitability and margins and, and all those things that keep us in business. Um, but in your doing prefab, what almost ends up happening is you start taking, you're still looking at direct hours, but then you're also looking at how did we produce this item? Um, and that it almost becomes more of that manufacturing mentality. You know, what was our direct cost to be able to produce that Unistrut rack mm -hmm. or to produce this, you know, piping skid or pumps or whatever? And how did we get how productive were we in the cutting stages of it? How productive were we in the assembly? How productive were we in the welding? How productive were we in the shipping pieces of it? Obviously there's still labor tied to all those things, but there's a shift in productivity to not just, Hey, did we go above or below the budgeted hours that we put for those things? But how productive were we? How many units per hour can we make or units per day or, each of those stages per day. And that's a bit of a mind shift switch um, mm -hmm. still tied to productivity, still tied to, you know, margins and profitability, but it shifts your thinking from, you know, budgets versus actuals on labor hours to, you know, units of production per hour or per some time period. Yeah. Uh, so looking back over the last five years, what, new realization or approach has helped you navigate the industry? Um, that's a new realization or approach. I would actually say, and it's one we, again, I think we take for granted, um, communication. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we have, this journey we're trying to go through where, you know, the industry is about 10% of the total cost of jobs is prefab. And that's, that's pretty, that's a high level for certain jobs. Like that's, you know, there's certain ones that are above that and there's others, but most of them are less quite honestly. Um, communication is probably the biggest blocker to that communicating the details, communicating statuses, communicating, where the pieces are communicating what pieces you need communicating what tools you need um and that's one of the things that i see you know in the last five years that that technology just like we're doing right now <laughs> we're on a video conference and communicating with each other halfway across the u.s yeah. um, in real time like we can use technology pieces to to facilitate that communication and communicate people hey what do i need to know right now what do I need to know tomorrow and what do I need to do something about? And that if that is going to be to me, contextualized communication is going to be the biggest agent of change. Yeah. Love that. Uh, so let's look forward five years now. What's your 
prediction uh, for what we'll be using and what the industry will look like in, in five years? Yeah, in, in five years, um, I would love to see voice be used a lot more um, mm -hmm. as an interface. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, mobile phones are awesome and we've got these super cool touch screens, but um, on a job site, that isn't the easiest way to, to interface with things. Uh, I'm going to date myself, but even, you know, some of the Blackberries and other things like that almost were easier. You still we wore them out because the stupid little spinning wheels got right. stuck. Right, <laughs> that always them, got stuck. <laughs> you always got stuck, but, you know, you could at least type on a keyboard with gloves on or, you know, things like that. Um, you know, touch screens again, really cool and really helpful, but it's, it's not the next level. I mean, I, five years from now, imagine if you're okay, maybe we're not quite to the full augmented reality headset type things, but if I was able to just have my tablet or my, you know, big workstation touchscreen right there and did my Alexa or Hey Siri type thing mm -hmm. and asked them, Hey, show me the That's details. Me. I can respond to you. Now I've got my Alexa talking in the background if you heard it. <laughs> nice. She's everywhere. <laughs> she is everywhere. But asking, hey, can you, sh you know, show me the um, installation details for this pipe spool? You know, how much am I supposed to torque this nut to? Mm -hmm. And it showed you those answers. Mm -hmm. um, I think that would be just, you know, phenomenal. And there's people working on that now. Um, you know, it's early stages, but I think voice is going to be probably the next wave of impact, you know, from a technology and things that we're using. And we'll take it for granted at that point. Well, you know, five years from now, you and I will be doing the same thing and be like, oh yeah, we kind of forgot that voice was a new thing for us. Right. Yeah. yeah it's crazy how uh, fast time moves in technology. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so tell us more about Manufacton and, and how people can get more information. Yeah. So Manufacton, um, we, we call ourselves the offsite construction platform. You know, our, our goal and our intentions is to really be a, a software platform that facilitates a lot of that communication, um, puts in some business rules so you can move through that whole um, supply chain, prefab, manufacturing uh, journey to get to all the way up to installation and being able to track your installation. So we give you some of that the software to digitize your processes and have things communicate throughout. So report back to a model in real time. Hey, are you, is this element being detailed? Is it in manufacturing? Is it in shipping? Is it in installation? Mm -hmm. So maybe a change order comes down the line and your detailers, you know, get that information. They go, wait a minute. Well, 10 of these units that you just did a change order for are already in manufacturing, or maybe they're already installed. Like our costs are going to be more than you thought they were. Do you, are you sure you want to do this? Or they can say, Oh, yep. Everything's cool. We haven't even done much with it. You know, we can just go detail it. That, that visibility, that communication is all right there in real time. Nice. Um, that's huge. Or, yeah, it's absolutely huge. And that's one aspect of what we do. And it also brings a lot of those details and information right to the work face, the work face being, Hey, if I'm a detailer, I'm it's right in my work face with my Revit plugin or um, other tools that I'm using. Or if I'm in manufacturing, I've got my production orders with all those in, you know, fabrication details right there at my work face, whether that's mm -hmm. an iPad or a, a phone or a big, you know, touch screen in the shop. Um, same with, you know, shipping and installation. I have my information I need right there at my work face. I'm not having to hunt it out, search it out, ask somebody for, you know, thousands of phone calls. I remember my superintendents, I felt like all they did was be on the phone all day long. And I'm like, you're our most experienced, you know, journeyman type people. Why are you just on the phone? I want you to help train people and look for holes, but yeah, that's what they do most of the time. <laughs> nice. Uh, and how do people uh, reach out to Manufacton to get more info? Yeah. Easiest way is uh, go on the website. So manufacton.com um, can go on there, request a demo or, you know, we've got phone numbers, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we're also partners of applied. And so, you know, reach out to their sales teams as well. Happy to, 
take any information and get people what they need. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for, for joining the show today, Jason. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Todd. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, glad to have you back sometime to unpack a, a whole lot more. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. And thank you to those listening. If you are interested in learning more, you can visit our sponsor, Applied Software at asti.com for more information. And you can listen to this podcast anytime by simply going to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, be sure to check out our website, bridgingthegappod.com. Until next time, I'm Todd Wyant, thanking you for joining us on the Bridging the Gap podcast. Keep innovating.